Good morning. We are in the center of the capital city of Albania, Tirana. And we got up extra early and drove in so it would be easy to secure a parking spot. And it worked out perfect. Now we have found a paid parking spot right next to the stadium. And we have about a 15 minute walk to get down to the area we want to see. We actually have about a 25 minute walk to our first stop of the day. But that's not bad when you're talking about the middle of a city. So let's cross the road <laughs> and then go check out the cool history of the city of Tirana. So I think Snow told you our parking spot is about 25 minutes away from the city center where all the activities are. So we've got a bit of a walk, but right out here where we're at, we found nice parking at this stadium. Not sure what the rate is, but we start our walk coming through a nice little residential area. And the walks I've already done around Tirana, it's a nice city. It's not a huge city, but it's a big city with lots of universities, lots of nice shops and restaurants. So I'm looking forward to this walk to the city to check it out. And look here, right here on the road, the United States flag. A little piece of home. <laughs> I'm guessing maybe they have Americana coffee there. <laughs> and as we come down through Tirana, one thing we've noticed is there is a ton of construction going on here. Now we were going to the hospital, we encountered the road construction, major highway projects, but there is also a lot of vertical construction, a lot of high rises, big developments and apartments going in. This one's downtown, it's a single unit, but we've seen where they're putting up dozens of units in quick order. And so it looks like the economy here is doing really well. At least investment dollars are pouring in. And I can see why, this is a beautiful city. Another thing that I really like about Tirana is there's a lot of trees in the city, so tree-lined streets, which always kind of helps the city have these little natural areas. All right, it looks like we're getting close here. I can start to see there's some more open plazas, a wider road. I think we're close to the square, right? Yeah, I think the actual, it's called Skanderbeg Square and it's the big city center. I think it's actually one block that way. But our first stop today is first we're going to find a cafe. I would like to find some juice. And then right up here we have a history museum. And the history here in Tirana is so amazing. We have to go to the museums here and share it with you. There's two we have on the list here today. So we're excited. We don't always do museums, but these have been on our uh, our radar for a while now. So that's why we're here, to share the history of this really cool country with you. Yeah, and also I think just the history of Albania itself has just captivated us. So I can tell you both the ancient history and the recent history are fascinating. So let's go check that out. What's Carlos's book? Oh. So our friend back from Medellin, Carlo, who was amazing with Kurt uh, while I was going through my knee replacement rehab there for a few months. He travels quite a bit and he likes to collect a book from the countries he goes to in that language. So if we pass a book place, we always kind of look. The book's called, what's it called? The Alchemist. The Alchemist. And the book is, as he says, translate, the most translated book in the world. Uh -huh. And so he's got a collection of several different languages. Uh, he doesn't have one from the Balkan regions. Yeah, so if we see one, we will pick it up and we will figure out how to get it to him because he'll be a friend for life and that'd be a cool little thing to do. This guy here on the street didn't have one though. Look at these little bumpers. They're like also seats. 
mushrooms, bumpers, and seats all in one. All right, look at this cool little engineering thing right here. On the stoplights, not only do the lights light up, but also the entire pole changes the color of the stoplight. That's pretty cool. That just makes sense. See, that one over there is red. Cool. That is fresh squeezed without a doubt. Half pomegranate, half orange. Something I learned I really liked when we were in. Uh, we were in bar in Starry Ma Bar. Starry Bar in Montenegro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this was a perfect little stop before we head to the museum. Fresh squeezed orange juice and pomegranate has now become one of Snow's favorites. Yeah, it's good. Along with cherry juice. Oh, this is a casino. <laughs> All right, we just stopped and had some juice. And I didn't even realize, we didn't realize we were hanging out at the Tirana Casino, the Regency Key Casino. That's a big church. All right, so we're just walking down the street. We see this beautiful, very modern church. We had no idea what kind it was. So the Google tells us it is the Resurrection of Christ Orthodox Church, a massive, modern Orthodox cathedral. Let's go see if we can stick our head in, guys. The stair treads are definitely marble. And it is a very big ornate church and they have a huge bell tower in the front. Take our hat off. Big ornate like golden doors. So we are approaching Skanderbeg Square and this is the area kind of where they have all the different museums and things and we're going to check out the History Museum right now. <laughs> Look at them riding, they got a big wheeled scooter. First room pops us into caveman times and what happened is in the 3000s BC, so a long time ago, there was an influx of people that came up from like the Turkey region and down in North Africa and all that and came up in here and this is the artifacts they found from that time frame. Now later, 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 when the Greeks were here, Homer actually references these people and how they were non-Greeks but they were still around a little bit I guess. Kind of an interesting time. 
So I think we're back like in the copper and bronze. This is the bronze era. And so this is, yeah, this was when they first started shaping tools and working with metals. The Illyrian population. Yeah, they started in the late 3000 BCs and carried through to 1050 BC. All right, so we're getting to some parts of history that are reflected in a lot of movies. So this is two gladiators fighting. Uh, kind of gives some proof to the thought of how they had the, the Coliseums or whatever where they did the gladiator fights and people had to give the, the thumbs up or thumb down whether they lived or died. But this is from 2nd century AD, so the 200s. We're into gladiator dives. We just crossed from BC to AD, I believe it is. So these two-handed buckets, I don't think they call them buckets, but their purpose was transporting water or wine. And with all the grapes in this region, I'm going to say they carried a lot of wine. <laughs> statues with their heads on. One of the things that's really cool about this museum is as we move through the periods and we've started really early in time, but they have different maps. And since we came in through the north in Schroeder, we can, and there's Kruhe, we can kind of see some of the castles that we saw along the way. Here's the one on the coast that we went to but we can also see the whole of Albania and where some of the other important strategic places were. And believe me, a lot of these are on our map, guys. So we're gonna to continue to get to know Albania more, but I love these maps because we hear these names of these people throughout time. And until now, we really didn't know who they were or where they come from. And this has given us a much better understanding the tax man has been around for a long time. These are tax records from Skodra in 1460. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. <laughs> and we come around the corner and there's a big scat statue of Skanderbeg. Now Skanderbeg is probably the single most important single figure of history here. And so you see him, statues of him. Uh, stories of him, his castles, we've walked on some, we've seen some other stuff everywhere. But anyway, it's pretty cool. And this is his signature helmet and you also see that around a lot. And look at that big sword. Another thing that's apparent as we come through this museum, we see the different weapons and tools from the time. And we can just see how they went from stonework eventually into metals. And even on stuff like this, which is, I call this back in the pirate times, but you can see the metal work is pretty good. And also at that time they used a lot of bone handles, but you see a mix of like ivory and bone and wood used along with the metals to make the weapons. Okay, so World War I, just a couple of years before that, there was the Balkans War. That ended in 1912. And at that time, Greece, Montenegro, and Serbia all staked claim to Albania. But what happened is more powerful European countries came in and kind of helped settle things and create Albania. Kind of kicked Greek, 
Serbia and Montenegro out and make Albania a country. That happened in 1914. And then there was still a lot of turmoil and a lot of angst going on in the country. Now, legend has it, stories have it, we don't know this for sure, but we think we will eventually take you to a bridge in northeast Albania where an assassination took place that some people say triggered World War I. Now we're not going to get into all of that right now because we want to tell that to you when we're actually standing on the bridge where it happened. But it was because people were still trying to come up from Turkey and in the Muslim areas down there and come up and stake a claim to Albania because everything was in such turmoil. So there is a lot of World War I history here and pre-World War I, the year or two before it. And I think Italy and Germany had a lot going on and kind of button heads here trying to help establish Albania. So quick little lesson and maybe we'll get you to that bridge and tell you how World War I actually started. So in 1939, Italy and the fascist regime under Mussolini, they attacked Albania. And I think this was also while Germany was coming down through. And so they had the world's attention and Italy tried to sneak in the back door in 1939 and they sent a bunch of troops to Duras, Skoder, uh, I think another place was Vlore, and then um, in Serenade as well. Wow, didn't know. So in 1940, Germany attacked Yugoslavia and Mussolini in Italy attacked Greece from Albania. So they had already taken Albania and we're moving on to Greece. So it looks like after World War II, the liberation of, of Albania began in about 1944. And soon after that is the communist regime is gonna come in and take over and shake Albania to its core. But um, that is gonna get covered in the next museum we go to. Well, we just finished at the museum, and to be honest with you, the name suits. It was definitely a history museum, and it took us really through Albania, like sort of from the beginning of time. Yeah, from 5000 BC, caveman times. Caveman, through all the different tools and weapons, the different wars and attacks, change of governments. I think Albania is super important in long time history because of its geographical location. If someone could capture Italy and Albania at the same time, they would own all of the Adriatic Sea and control all the ports and would have tons of power. So, and that may have happened like back in Venetian times and all of that, but it makes you understand why so much war has happened right here. So right outside of the history museum here is Skanderbeg Square. Now, we've told you about him in past videos. If you've missed him, you just need to know he is an iconic and very, very important war hero for Albania and just did some miraculous things against the Ottoman Empire. So they have this wide open space and you can see lots of people coming out and about and enjoying this beautiful day we have, which we haven't even mentioned yet. But you don't see here in Tirana all of the old buildings that we've been used to seeing in in Europe. The churches are new, everything's new and shiny, and I think that's a reflection of everything being built and developed after the communist regime that ruled here until 1992. But it's the first European city we've been in where there's no 300 year old churches. So I wanted to point that out. We're gonna grab a bite to eat, enjoy this day in this park with everybody else out here, then we're taking you to the Bunkart Museum, which is all about the communist time here.
found a nice little cafe with a lunch of the day special. I think we're getting carrot soup, some sort of spinach salad or pastry, we don't know, and a chicken with maybe some pesto. But it's right on the edge of the square, so we're getting to do some great people watching. There is a lot of activity. This is a bustling, really cool city. Look at this, guys. Looks Perfect. good. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, man. You. Appreciate it. Wow, look at this, guys. It's a chicken pasto, carrot soup. There's some bread. And this is the spinach like cake thing that they make. Looks good. Yeah. $7. Perfect. Perfect. Deal of the day. Carrot soup, wow, that's pretty tasty actually. <laughs> Loving the carrot soup. Lunch was delicious, perfectly sized. The grand total tip, drinks, and everything was 20 US dollars or 2,000 lek. And we had the perfect seat to just do some amazing people watching there in the Skanderbeg Square. What a nice little atmosphere for the locals that live here and for the tourists that visit. But now it is time to walk a short two minutes away and take you to Bunkart, which is a museum in an underground bunker about the communist regime here in Albania. So this museum is literally in an old bunker. Here we go, Kurt. You ready for this? This is fascinating. This place is a bit overwhelming. We have walked through the whole thing. And I think when we get out of here, we'll try to do our best to give you a recap. But um, I can't think of the word of how I feel. It's definitely not humbling, but this place will do a number on you when you walk through here. But you have to know history so it doesn't repeat itself. And this kind of laid out how it started and how it progressed and how it got so bad. We made the 20 minute walk back to our van after going through the communist uh, bunker museum. So we're gonna try to give you a, just a snapshot. So coming out of World War II in Bar Hoxha, became the head of the Labour Party here in Albania, which was a communist party. Part of the new government in the 40s was to develop a police force. And over the next five to 10 years, the police force started getting new and new doctrines of how to operate. And you could see how it was just getting a little bit more skewed towards uh, policing for the government government rather than for the people. Well, also they were getting more and more intrusive in terms of how they were capturing information and yeah. spying and all sorts yeah, of stuff. Yeah, stuff you could see through here. And this time frame ran from, I guess, the mid-40s up until 1992 when communism fell here officially. Hoxha was the head of the Labor Party or the head of the Communist Party during most of that time. But in this museum, they walk you through the timeline of how it slowly progressed to being basically a police state. And they had an internal organization. What were they called? Segiro. Segiro or Segimu or something. I'll try to put it, we'll try to put it on the screen. And I kind of relate that to the CIA or the KGB, yeah. that kind of a internal Workforce, police force, and they spied on the people. They interrogated the people. They had informants. They yeah. had bugs. They had little cameras. They hide in their 
jackets. They were listening to people. There was one really interesting story where I think it was in the 80s during a big parade to honor the government in the in the city of Duras. A few citizens managed to, with all the distraction of the parade, go and escape almost because at this time, guys, you couldn't leave Albania if you lived here. Think like North they Korea. They closed the border. Yeah. They had, they literally had like a, a barbed yeah. wire fence around there. And, and they had dogs. They had dogs. Border agents that were with attack dogs. That if you got caught trying to leave, basically you were going to get attacked by this dog and likely die. So kind of in modern day times, think North Korea. You could not leave even if you wanted to. But four or five brothers and sisters, I can't remember, managed to escape and enter the Italian embassy. And this kind of caused an issue uh, because the government knew they were in there. And Italy didn't want to ruffle too many feathers because they were trying to maintain some sort of re relationship with Albania at the time. But these four or five brothers and sisters lived in the Italian embassy for five years. And during that time, the government was actually not just spying on people, their residents at that time, but they had like secret forces trying to spy inside of the embassies. And if for some crazy reason you wanted to come here as an international visitor, the minute you cross the border, what'd they call you? Uh, I can't, I can't remember. You were a security but... alert. You yeah, were flagged. Yeah, 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 you were flagged. You definitely. were, yeah. You were followed. You had somebody assigned. You basically had a team assigned to you to watch you. And they, they had bugs and everything. They had cameras in the hotel rooms, yeah. elevators, all kinds yeah. of stuff. They manipulated photos for propaganda. So not only were they taking spy photos to use against you in interrogations, but they would, pro, you know, today it would be clip art or you know, Photoshop them all up. But they were. Like high tech spy stuff yeah. that you see in James Bond movies. Yeah, it's like. But the way they monitored the Italians, I wanted to tell this story because it was very interesting to me. And we kind of split up and just in this museum, guys, it's it's big and it's all in an underground bunker. But the they recruited the internal police force recruited a maid, and she went in and she planted five or six bugs all around the embassy, and she planted them kind of obviously so that they would be found and the plan was that the embassy would find them and be like oh we've got all the bugs they can't watch us but she also had a bug in her broom handle it was a little camera and a little microphone so every day when she went to work and was sweeping all around the embassy she was carrying a bug and a, a camera into every single room and every night the secret police force would come to her house and download the footage and give her new batteries. So they were sneaky. And um, they also, there was some very sad parts of this museum. It kind of had a really kind of a brutal ending. I mean, not that any of it was pleasant, but it had a brutal ending. Yeah, it, it looked like there were two time periods that were really, really bad. So the mid 40s to the mid 50s, there was a lot of information on concentration camps that mimicked the kind of stuff that went on in Germany and all of that. And then the, the, you know, they call them internment camps, came back in the 80s. So they're, they're, on the TVs they would be playing interviews of people that are our age, maybe 10 years older, that had lived through these internment camps. And then there was a list of all the different ways that you could be tortured. I'm not gonna go through them, but sitting there reading through the list of torture techniques that these people used on their own citizens that's what makes you leave there with a really sick feeling in your but, stomach but basically but basically what they would do is they would sort you out and if they felt like you were a threat against their government or maybe you had money or something like that they had their criteria and we met people since we've been in Albania whose family had to flee. They couldn't cross the border. Some were put in jail. Some, some were died. put in these encampments. And some some were some were put to death. Yeah. And so we've actually heard that from people as we come. So kind of this museum really, you know, this wasn't so much about the history of the history, no. older history museum. This is this very modern times. More modern, but... Well, uh, was we were walking back and you're walking the streets and you're passing these people it, most of them lived through this it's not something that they're learning in their history books during this time i would have been in high school yeah you know or just finishing up high school and going to college as communism was falling 
So that I think just makes it a little bit more real. If you're ever in this part of the country, it doesn't take long. You need to take the time to go down here and just walk through there and take it all in yourself. Because if we don't study history, especially the bad history, it will repeat itself. Yeah, and I gotta tell you, you know, you come into a city and you never know what to expect. And we went to a couple history museums, which can kind of lead to a serious time. But you, as you as you walk into the city, and then as we walked out, and you see how modern and beautiful Tirana is with all the really nice restaurants, the beautiful people, all the shops. I mean, it's really a vibrant vibrant town and so you look at kind of the present in contrast with the history yeah and you really just kind of sit back and think wow this country has really made a big comeback Al albanians seem to very much be into the arts they are definitely into fashion they are trendy fashionable people especially here in the city but all over the country and um it, you, you see that their apartments and their homes and their restaurants are decorated nice and I think that might be because back during those times there was no freedom to do that you, you couldn't go buy a nice shirt or a cool pair of shoes so I think now they really take pride in in their freedom of choices and uh, it's a pretty city we like it, it here it's a, it's it's a really pretty city it's fun to walk around it's colorful it's not a real huge city. No. I think so said the population just is over around. just over a half a million. So it's a it's a smaller size city, but they got a metro feel for sure. They definitely have a metro feel, and it's cool. We've enjoyed our time yeah. here. But we're trying to figure out where we're going to spend the night. <laughs> whether we're going to stay here in this parking lot next to the soccer stadium, or whether we're going to sneak out of the city when traffic dies down. But we are definitely in the van for the night, and uh. We're going to take a little break here and kind of recuperate from the feeling that museum puts on you as you leave there. All right, Tony said he'd give me a hand patching this up, cleaning up this little fender bender we had. And uh, if you could see the fenders like cracked all the way through and around down here. And he's going to heat it up and I guess stick it together. I don't know. We'll see. We will stick with iron. Stick with iron. All right, he's got some little tie wire here. He's cutting up into little pieces. This is not the first time he's done something like this, I can tell. He took one look at it. He said, I know exactly what we need to do. Tony's made all those clips. And now he's got his little torch here. He's going to heat him up with that. You can see there in the fire. Tony's put all these clips in there. He just cut the wire and melted the clips in there. And, uh, oh, it looks like now he's got a battery operated grinder. He's just gonna come and knock those off. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. Tony, Tony. It's not very beautiful, but it's uh, functional. So, guys, it is Sunday. Just to update you, we have left downtown Tirana and come to a hotel type campsite really close to the Tirana airport. And uh, we did that because my flight is Tuesday and today is Sunday. But we woke up this morning and Lufthansa flight crews, so the flight attendants, are going on strike. They're going on a planned strike on Tuesday which means we woke up to chaos in the airline industry in Germany where I'm flying through and right now it looks like I will not be flying home on Tuesday because there will be no flights going in and out of Frankfurt because of the strike. That's what we're dealing with and we'll be back in a minute. After many hours of the terrible telephone music from Lufthansa, getting disconnected, going online, getting stressed out with chat bots we finally resolved the issue i was supposed to fly out on tuesday morning and have 18 hours of flights to get me from tirana through frankfurt and finally to orlando 
what ended up happening is I will be leaving on Monday afternoon and taking a flight to Frankfurt where I will spend the night in a hotel at the airport, get up the next day and get my flight to Orlando. It's the only way we could work it out without everything being delayed and messing up everything I had scheduled at home. So problem solved with a little bit of added fuss, but it's all okay. Kurt's about to whip us up some dinner. I started getting everything packed and we'll see you in the morning as Kurt takes me to drop me off at the airport. Are you excited, Kurt, or are you going to miss me? She's leaving us early, guys. She's leaving us early. I'm a little sad about being away from my kitties for an extra night, but it was either that or have to reschedule everything, and I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> So tomorrow, it's a big flight to Frankfurt and a night in the hotel for snow. We'll see y'all in the morning. See you guys in a few days. Cheers. See us now. She's gone, guys. Just like that, she's out of here. And so are we. We'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you guys know when we put out new videos. And don't forget, you can always follow us over on Instagram to see what's going on in between videos. Cheers, guys.